All right, well, welcome to the Math 136 lectures for um, week six. And uh, as usual, um, you uh, should be hearing audio right now. If you're not, you can check your volume control and your audio settings, and you can use the Zoom tech support line at 1-888-799-9666, extension two, if you need further assistance. You are welcome to participate um, in a couple different ways. You can use the Zoom reactions um, to raise your hand electronically. Um, and feel free to unmute then to ask your question from there, um, or you can uh, use the chat feature um, in either way is just fine for that. So we will get started. Like I said, this is week six. And in week six, as you probably saw in the um, live lecture schedule, which I just have linked here to remind everybody that in that live lecture schedule, which is where the Zoom links are to join, there's also a little side menu that you can quickly scroll to week six topics. And then after the sessions are done, the recordings are at the bottom of that. So you will see the Wednesday uh, session is already there. And then later the this session for Friday and Saturday will, will show up there as well. Because we all are talking about the same content um, for the most part, but some of us might cover and stress one thing more so than another. Um, so it might be useful to um, uh, you know view portions or all of the other lectures, if that's something that you would like to partake of. Uh, and then there's a feedback link that's here. I'll show that on the screen at the end as well, um, that we'd love to have your feedback with that. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and look at what we were going to talk about for this week. So section, um, this is the last chapter um, for the course, um, chapter six, and that includes this week for section six, one, six, two, six, three, and six, four. So what is this all about? It's all about composition of functions, putting two functions together where one function kind of goes into another, um, looking at inverse functions where one function kind of reverses the process of another function. You can think of it that way. And then we get into two new types of functions in 6.3 exponential functions, and then in 6.4 logarithmic functions. And so this is just kind of some of the stuff that I'm gonna to touch on today. I think the lecturer from Wednesday <clears throat> spent quite a bit of time on 6.1 and 6.2 and a little bit of 6.3, um, and then maybe ran short for time to talk about 6.4. Um, some of you have like multiple due dates in a week. And so you may have already possibly had a due date for your 6.1 and 6.2. But what I'm going to try and do is I, I'm going to try and start a little backwards. I'm going to start with 6.3 and 6.4 and then talk a little about 6.1 and 6.2 as much as I can. But since I know the Wednesday lecture kind of hit heavy on those, um, again, and there's a recording available, um, you can always kind of put those together to get kind of everything. Um, what I will say about comp composition of functions before I move on to the other um, parts is the notation. I just want to make sure everybody's clear on the notation for this. Um, it's not multiplication. And that's one of the biggest confusions that students have is this is really putting one function inside of another function. So that g of x that I just highlighted there is the inside function. And it's the output of the inside function. Um, Maybe I'll say inside function output. And so your input x goes into the composition and uh, it goes into function g first. You start from the inside and work your way out and then you get an output value for that. Then that value that you get for g of x becomes the input to function f. And so function f is your outside function. And so again, I want to make the distinction that this is not multiplication. But if you don't have someone verbally explaining that to you, I could see how the f parenthesis g of x looks like multiplication. Um, but it's not. Um, so again, there. if I have time at the end, I'll do some problems with that. But I'm going to focus mainly on 6.3 and 6.4. And again, the Wednesday lecture did um, quite a few examples with 6.1 and 6.2. Um, and again, I can always try and come back, or if you certainly have a question, I can answer it about that. One-to-one -one functions and inverse functions in 6.2, um, one-to-one basically means uh, literally you have for your, your outputs, 
they are different with your different inputs. Um, here's a little picture of a, a graph um, showing a, a, a function that is one-to-one. -one. It passes what's called the horizontal line test. Um, or sorry, that one fails the horizontal line test, um, but you want to have one that, that passes um, the horizontal line test where your horizontal line only crosses once. So I might have a graph of something um, like this. And if I threw a horizontal line in here at any given place, it's only gonna hit my graph once. And so that one would be one-to-one -one, uh, for that. That's important because that allows you to have inverse functions. And so inverse functions um, basically reverse each other. And so for a function to have an inverse function, it has to first be one-to-one -one or be restricted on its domain so it can become one-to-one. -one. So um, here's a little diagram showing a function in blue on the left and a function in red on the right that is the inverse function. And so I wanna mention the notation. The notation we use or the symbol that we use to designate the inverse function looks like it's a function f with a negative one exponent, but we don't read it as a negative one exponent. And it doesn't mean the same thing as a negative one exponent. We read that as literally the inverse function of f. So again, that's some subtle things that if you're just reading your ebook um, you know, that might not be obvious to you um, without hearing someone explain that to you, but that's how we read that. And they are symmetrical, a function in its inverse um, in this picture here, they are symmetrical um, with respect to the line y equals x. So this line y equals x is this diagonal line uh, that cuts through quadrants one and three, and uh, the points can flip over that line from the function in the inverse and match up with each other and be symmetrical. As you can see in the diagram, kind of connected with the black line from point to point. What that also means, if you look at any one of these ordered pairs, they flip flop. So notice for the function, it's A and then B, and that's just a subscript of three because that's the third point on the graph. Um, and then for the inverse, it switches around. It's B and then A. And so that's what happens with an inverse. You're basically doing the reverse um, for things with that. Um, and so because of that reversal, then some neat things happen with the domain and range. So if I have some set circles and I'm talking about the function, and so um, since my function up here was in blue, I'll try and use blue here. If I'm talking about my function and I go from my domain of my function to the range of my function. So I'm using capital D and R for domain and range <clears throat> with a subscript of F to talk about my function. Um, those, you know, I start with my values in my domain. So I have some values over here and then they go to values over here in my range. If I'm talking about the inverse function, which again in the symmetrical graph is in red. So I'll do this in red too. I'm reversing that. So now I'm starting where I left off for the range of the function. And that's going to be the same thing as the domain of the inverse function. So that set circle contains the same values. What comes out of the function can go into as the domain, the inverse function. And then what it does is it takes you to the range, the output of the inverse function, which is the same set of values that matches the domain of the function. So, um, and that's kind of summarized here, is that uh, the domain of your function is the same as your range of your inverse, and the range of your function is the same as the domain of your inverse. And then procedurally, when you want to um, find an inverse of a function that's one-to-one, -one, because of this idea of the domain and range kind of swapping with each other, or these points that I circled here, kind of swapping their coordinates, that's exactly what you do when you have an equation. You first thing you do is you interchange or swap the X and Y variables, and then you have a, a new equation to solve um, for the new position of your Y variable, because it got swapped with your X. Um, and then when you get done solving for that uh, Y that had gotten swapped, you have then found your actual inverse function, okay? 
Um, so again, I'll try and do some problems if we have time at the end, but that's kind of the gist of some of the key things to know about those sections. I'm gonna focus on content and um, sample problems with 6.3 and 6.4. So in 6.3, we are introducing exponential functions. And I'm not gonna read through this whole list. I'd rather kind of jump into the problems. Um, but this is a reminder of some things you should know about working with exponents. And this is from like pre-algebra. So whatever algebra class you had prior to coming into Math 136, whether it was called pre-algebra or intermediate algebra or whatever it was, whether it was at Ivy Tech or not, um, you should all know and be familiar with some basic exponent rules. And that's what's kind of just summarized here because they still apply because working with exponential functions is essentially working with exponents. Um, you know that you have an exponential function by the way it looks. So here is the format of an exponential function. You have what's called a base number or what is commonly also referred to as a growth factor. So this A down here is your base number. And then notice where the variable is. The variable is the exponent. So the variable is the exponent, or you can call it a power if you prefer to call it a power. Um, and that's how you know you have an exponential function. If your variable is the base and you have a number, I'm just gonna pick one, three, as the power, this is not exponential. This is a um, power function or part of a polynomial or a, uh, a monomial, just one single term. So again, the, the variable has to be the power um, for this to be an exponential function. And then you might have a coefficient that is in front. Um, often it's one, but it doesn't have to always be one. Um, and that can be your initial value here when you have an input of zero. So that's kind of the, the basics of that. Um, in terms of the graph of an exponential function, so here you see just a basic equation for an exponential function where the C value is one. So this assumes that constant C I just talked about would be a one in front of that. Um, so here's a graph of what you should kind of have as a visual in your mind about an exponential function. So it curves increasingly from left to right, and it always goes through this x-intercept zero one uh, for its basic function unless it's been trans transformed in some way. And it also has this horizontal asymptote, y equals zero, that you can see there is a red dotted line um, that kind of traps and bounds the curve where it goes. And then it's got these other couple points that are related to its base. It goes through one comma the base and then negative one comma the reciprocal of the base. And this is when your base is larger than one. And so this is an increasing function and that's kind of described here. But if your base is not larger than one, but instead it is between zero and one. So it, it, it has to be a positive. That's why it's starting at greater than zero. But if it goes greater than zero, but then goes up to, but not including one, then we're talking about some fractional amount. Like maybe the base is a half. Maybe it's um, a third. Um, or it could be written with a negative exponent as well. Um, and so if that's the case, the only thing that really changes on this graph is now this graph is decreasing instead of increasing. So from left to right, the graph is coming and decreasing down um, as you read this. But notice that the um, asymptote is the same. Um, this y equals zero, that dotted line, the y, um, sorry, not, yeah, the y-intercept 0, 1 is the same and things with the points there. So that's kind of giving you an overview of that. Um, one of the common bases you will see with an exponential function is with an e. e is an irrational value. It's a number. It's kind of like pi. People are probably more familiar with pi um, in that we use that kind of symbol of an e to represent it. It's a script e. and um, should you ever go on to calculus, some of you might, some of you might not, um, it comes from this idea of a limit. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. I just wanna tell you that's where it comes from. But this is what the graph looks like. So it's exponential. E is approximately uh, 2.72, that's rounded. 
um, just like we can approximate pi with 3.14, um, for example, even though that's not the exact value. And so it's close to the number two. It's between two and three. And so you can see here, um, we've got a graph that's a little bit more um, vertical, kind of growing up faster. Um, the larger your base number is, the faster your function is growing. It's going to be a little bit steeper when you, when you look at it. If I had a lower um, uh, base number, then it wouldn't grow as fast. So it might, might be something like that. That's not as steep. So those are some of the nuts and bolts. Um, another property that's introduced in this section <clears throat> is this property here. This property allows you to take something that has the same base, so A and A, so those are the same bases, and it, they have the same base and they're equal to each other. You can basically remove the bases and set the powers or exponents equal to each other. That's what that is basically saying, okay? So I'm gonna go into some examples, kind of using some of these ideas. Okay. So one thing I want to make sure everybody's aware of is some of your problems in my lab will ask you to do some graphs. And you've used graphs probably in my lab a few times already. Um, but what I want to make sure specifically for exponential functions is to be careful that you select the correct curve shape first. So when you click on a graph, it brings up this graphing tool. You want to make sure <clears throat> that that's the one you're choosing for exponential. Okay, because it looks like, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the shape of the graph that I just got done showing you, that's an increasing graph, okay? So you wanna choose that first. And then <clears throat> after you click on the graph somewhere, which I've already done, which is why you see the yellow curve here, then you may remember when you guys did transformations, you get this extra toolbox for transformations. And what you need to be careful about, let me move my circle there. So you get this extra toolbox for transformations. What I wanna call your attention to is down here at the very bottom in this box, it says base. You want to make sure that what is in there matches the base of your problem. That is editable. And I find in the past that many students overlook that. And so they go and create their graph. They might apply a transformation that they see in the problem and then they get it wrong. And then it'll show you the correct graph and then your graph. And to your naked eye, they could look like they're the same graph. And then you're infuriated because you're like, why did I get it wrong? And it's probably just because like hypothetically, let's say your base was supposed to be um, a function that was y equals um, two to the x. Your base is two. So you would need to change what the default base is, which is e. So the default base is e. If your problem isn't with an E, then you change this to whatever it is for your base. And so you just delete the E and then you type in your actual base. So um, that's a place where, again, I see lots of students get something wrong because I just said E was approximately 2.71, or excuse me, 2.72 with rounding. If you were to graph E to the X, but it's really supposed to be 2 to the X, to your I, e to the x and 2 to the x are going to look very similar and you're not going to see like why is it wrong but to the computer software it's going to be wrong because they're not going to be in the exact same spots that they need to be on the grid okay so i just want to make sure i mention that um, you have a homework problem that'll be similar to that that uses this tool i think you have a handful of homework problems that use it but number nine was one that um, i saw quickly when i was looking through the homework set that that uses that tool and i want to caution you on making sure Sometimes, you know, you will have the default E and then that works fine. Um, but if, it, if your problem isn't with an E, you want to change that. All right. So then um, I want to talk about calculator usage, because this is one of the places where when we're talking with exponential functions and then we will get into log functions, um, you will want to use your calculator. 
um, for some things, not everything. There are gonna be problems that you have where the instructions explicitly say, do not use your calculator, actually. Um, and if you've started your homework, you may have already seen that. Um, and then there'll be problems that do ask you to use your calculator because it'll give you some rounding instructions um, and we'll tell you that as well. So I want to uh, talk about like some problems where you would need to do that. So first of all, depending on whether you have a scientific or a graphing calculator, your buttons are gonna be in different places, but they should be approximately the same in terms of what you see on the buttons. So you will have either a key that looks like it says X to the Y on it. So, you know, that's your button. Or you will use the caret key button, um, which again, is just, you know, a button with the upside down V basically, that's your caret key. You use that to do powers, okay? Um, you will also see most likely on your calculator an X squared button. You only, only can use X squared button or key if the power is actually two. So if you're not substituting in for your variable an actual value of two, then you do not want to use the X squared key. Instead, you're gonna be using the X to the Y or the caret key. And again, everybody's got different brands of calculators. Some people have Casio, some people have TI for Texas Instruments. There's multiple versions of calculators within the Casio family and within the TI family. And then the graphing calculators are often different from the scientific calculators. So I encourage you that if you are confused on your own particular brand of calculator and type, you reach out to your instructor and say, I have such and such calculator. Um, I'm struggling with doing, you know, whatever it is, finding my caret key, or I don't know how to do a power. Um, and, and they could probably assist you um, because while we may not use every calculator, um, they all function mostly the same. And, and since we've used them a lot, we can usually help direct you. So here's an example problem that would require to use a calculator. Um, and I know that because not because it tells me to, but because it gives me these extra instructions to round to the nearest whole number as needed. So if there's rounding instructions, that's a probably a, a, a clue that you're gonna have to use a calculator for things. Um, so this is a, a price in dollars for a specific car that is X years old. And so the first question is how much should a three-year-old car cost? So a three-year-old car, so X is how old it is. So this power, should be a three. So what I would be calculating is $22,265 um, times 0 0.88 raised to the third power. That's what I need to calculate, okay? So that three goes for the power. So in my calculator, I would probably enter 22,000, I probably wouldn't have a comma, because calculators don't usually use those. So 22,265 um, times, and it's probably an asterisk or um, when it shows up on your screen, but I'm just gonna write the times or the multiplication button. Um, and then you can put literally what you see on the screen, parentheses 0 0.88, close parentheses. And then most calculators, you're gonna be using the caret key, um, so I'm gonna use that in my notation. So then I would hit the caret key and then I would enter three. And then I would hit either equals or enter again, depending on um, which button your calculator has. Some, some have an equal sign, some have an, a button that just says enter, okay? So that's what you're entering. If you do that correctly, and then you also round to a whole number, so nothing past the decimal point, um, you should get 15,173. So I encourage you, if you happen to have your calculator handy, to make sure that you can enter in that calculation and get that answer. Um, and then as it changes, you know, the next part says, what if, what if it was eight years old? Well, then you would just change the X to an eight. Um, and so for, for that question, to get the answer of $8,007, you would be changing this three to an eight. Um, for part B. 
and so on and so forth, okay? Um, sometimes your calculator problem will involve a base of E instead. So I found one in the homework, number 21, that uses a base of E. So again, all your calculators should have something in it to help you, whether it's scientific or graphing, and you will have a button that looks like e to the x. However, you probably have to hit second in order to get to it. And what you're hitting to get to it after it is probably a button that says ln. And behind that button, you'll see on your calculator screen, like on the, or on the face of it, you'll see above that in the color that matches your second or possibly a shift button. So this could also say shift, okay, either one, um, depending on the brand of your calculator. And so when you hit second with LN, um, you get the E to the X to show up on your screen. So if I needed to evaluate this function here that's tracking the number of milligrams of a certain drug that's in a, somebody's bloodstream after H hours of uh, having been administered that drug, if I wanna know how much is present after one hour, then the H is being replaced with the one hour. If I wanna know after five hours, then the H is being replaced with five hours. So I'm just gonna write out um, the second one here. So I would have D of five, to calculate that, I would have seven times E raised to a power of negative 0.17 times five. Now, how would I enter that in my calculator? I would literally, um, so calculator, I would literally enter, um, I'd hit the seven key, and then I would do my combination down here of second ln. And what would show on my screen is I would have seven and then I would have E. Um, and again, each one is a little slightly different. Um, but when I hit that E to the X, usually it'll do like E caret parenthesis, depending on the brand of your calculator. Um, it might just do E and it might just have a box waiting for you to enter in the exponent. Again, it depends on the brand of your calculator. But I would need to put in, this is a negative sign, not the minus key. So somewhere on your calculator, again, it varies, but it's usually somewhere near the bottom underneath your numbers. There is a negative key that looks exactly like what I wrote. It has parentheses around it and then a dash, and that's your negative key, not your subtraction or minus key. So when I say minus, I mean subtraction. That one is with your addition, multiplication, and division, um, and it doesn't have parentheses around it. You do not want to use the minus key. You wanna use the negative key. So because I need that negative sign, I would continue entering um, my negative key, and then um, I would put in my zero, my decimal, my one, my seven, and then I can actually do what I have here. I have it in parentheses five, or I, um, I, or I could hit multiplication five, either way. Um, so I could do parentheses, and I'm just gonna scoot over here, and then my five key, and then I could close my parentheses. And so what I'll see on the screen as I do all that is when I hit the negative key, the negative sign comes in and then 0 0.17. And then I would have, when I hit the parentheses, left parentheses, I'd have another parentheses, and then I'd see a five, and then I'd see a close of a parentheses. And then I'd wanna um, close off this parentheses that automatically opened when I did this combination of second LN to get my E to the X key. So I'd have to close that parenthesis so it closes this off. So now this whole expression here is my exponent. If you have a calculator where you're just entering things in a box, then that's where you would have 
the negative 0.17 times five. And so if you do that correctly for this particular problem and you round to two decimal places, that's how you would get this 2.99 milligrams. Um, you actually get 2.991904 and then it keeps going. Um, so that's that's how you would you know work that out. So you know just you guys probably do this yourself, but I started just kind of googling some videos and some instructions and diagrams of like how do you find your EDDX key? How do you find natural log key? So like here's a screenshot. This is the calculator I actually use, a TI30X2S, um, and so your caret key is kind of diagonally up above the seven key. Um, and your e to the x key, it's not drawn on here, but I can draw it. So you would hit your second and then your ln key is right here. And so um, behind that, there's an e to the x. Um, it depends on what you do with your calculator. So, you know, I found all kinds of things. Um, so like here's where it was, you know, just explaining what I just explained um, to get your, your e to the x. And so you can, you can find these things, but let me share in the chat a link here that contained all of these. So if you want to check them out yourself, and maybe you've even already Googled these, and maybe you've seen them, but there's this one channel that this uh, one person has for lots of different types of calculators, different versions of TI calculators, different scientific calculators, Casio calculators, different graphing calculators. So hopefully you find one that matches the calculator that you have, and that might help you. Or like I said, reach out to your instructor um, who would be glad to help you. And again, if you've got any questions, let me know. Okay, so then I started looking at, well, where's some other problem areas that the students um, often might run into in this section six, um, three. And one of those things is with using our exponent properties to solve equations. So remember, I kind of did a very brief intro and said, you guys should all know these laws of exponents from previous classes. But then at the end, I introduced this new property that if they have the same base, um, set equal to each other on each side, then you can kind of remove those and set the exponents equal. That new property combined with these former properties or laws um, can be utilized in different ways. So I want to look at a problem that uses that. So this is a problem that <clears throat> asks you to solve this for your variable. Notice that your variable is in two different places. Um, but they're both an exponent. Um, so there first is an X on the nine. And I can make that a little bit bigger because that's very small font. Okay, so there's an X that's on the nine, but then there's an X squared that's on the three. So there's two different bases here. There's a base of nine and a base of three with two different exponents. And then that's, those two are multiplied together and then equal to 81 squared. So we need to solve that for x. Well, we have to use exponent properties to help us. So the first thing I see is I see that I can rewrite 9 as a base number of 3 raised to a power. So recall that 9 is the same thing as 3 squared. Those are equivalent. So three squared is just another form of nine. So I'm going to first replace that with three squared. So what that's gonna get me is three squared in place of nine, which is still going to be raised to an X. So I'm not changing that X, I'm just changing out the nine. And then that's times three raised to the X squared equals 81 squared, okay? And then I recognize that right here, when I have a power raised to a power, that's one of those laws of exponents that I said everybody should know from a previous math class before you get into college algebra. You learn that in intermediate algebra or pre-algebra. And so those, when you have a power to a power, you multiply those. So I can rewrite that first part here 
as instead of three squared in parentheses to the x, this is three raised to the power of just two times x. So base is three, the power is the product of two times x. And that's being multiplied still by the rest of this, three raised to the x squared equaling 81 squared. So I'm just using properties to rewrite what I have. So then I think, oh, well, I see another property I can use. I see that when I have these same bases and I am doing a product, just let me not write with the highlighter. When I'm writing with the same bases and I have a product, we add exponents or add powers. That's one of our previous laws. So I can rewrite this on the next line as three raised to the two X plus X squared equaling 81 squared, okay? Um, then I think, hmm, I have a base of three over here on the left. I have a base of 81 on the right. Well, that new property that we had, that I'll flip back to at the end, said, well, if I've got these bases being the same, I can remove them and set what I had as my exponents equal. Well, I have a three and an 81. So then I asked myself, well, wait a minute. Oops. Can I do something similar to what I did with this nine before? that I rewrote as three squared. Is there something I can do with this 81 to make it use a three? And so if it doesn't immediately jump out to you, you can use your calculator to kind of help you and see like three raised to what power gives me 81. And so if you don't immediately know, you know, try three squared, three to the third, three to the fourth, three to the fifth. And what you would find out is that three to the fourth equals 81. So I'm going to swap out 81 with three to the fourth. So now I've got three raised to the two X plus X squared equals three to the fourth raised to the second. And now I'm gonna utilize the same property I had before up here where I recognize that I could um, take and multiply the powers I can do the same thing here. I can multiply these powers of four and two so that now I have um, three raised to the two X plus X squared equals three raised to the four times two or eight. And now I see I have the same bases. So these are the same. So therefore, I can drop them and I can solve 2x plus x squared equaling eight. Now I can set the exponents equal to each other. And now this is a quadratic equation. And so I'm gonna reorder this in descending order, x squared plus two x. I'm also going to move the eight to the left side by subtracting it. So I get x squared plus 2x minus 8 equals 0. And now I can try factoring it because it looks like maybe it does. And so I get x and x. And I can try, say, 4 and 2. I need a positive 2 in the middle. So I'll put the positive on the bigger number, 4, and a minus at the end. So that those multiply to negative 8. But when I add them, I get my positive 2 in the middle. And so set each of those equal to 0 and get negative 4 or 2. And so that matches our answers in our solution set that we separate with a comma if we have more than one of them, which we do. And so um, I'm using old information. Quadratic equations is something you guys did all the way at the beginning of you know, the semester, probably in week one. And then I'm using a lot of um, old exponent rules with a new property or rule um, about those same bases. Okay, so a good problem to incorporate a lot of things you need to know um, overall. All right, 
And again, feel free to ask questions. Those are the things I want to talk about in 6.3. The other things I want to talk about in 6.4 is with logarithmic functions. And the big, big, big thing about log functions, is what we call them for short, log, um, is this definition here. Like, what exactly is it? Okay, what is a logarithm? A logarithm is defined in such a way that what you see here is um, y is defined to be the log or logarithm with base a of x. So you can see here, it tells you how to read that. x is the input to the log function. It might help some of you if this is written as log base a with the x in parentheses to show that x is the input to the log function. So something always goes into the log, okay? So I will often see students just write something like this, log base A, and they don't have anything after it. That's incorrect. You always have to have something after it that represents the input to the log function. So log base A of X is defined to be Y if and only if, we know that x is defined to be base a raised to the y. So what does that mean? Well, this is exponential form. So on the right, I have, I'm gonna abbreviate here, exponential form. On the left, I have log form. The if and only if part tells me that I can convert from one to the other. Um, and it doesn't matter. I can start with the log form and convert to the exponential form, or I can start with the exponential form and switch over to the log form, okay? Um, and what this shows is that if I had this exponential function, actually, let me use a highlighter instead. If I had this exponential function and I have y as my exponent. That is the result of if I had started with y equals a to the x in exponential form, and then I swapped my x and y so that it became x equals a to the y. That's what we do to find an inverse, which I very briefly described at the beginning that was in section 6.2 um, that I said the Wednesday lecture spent some time on and that most likely some of you have already had due dates for your assignment on that. So maybe you've already looked at inverse functions. And then you have to solve for y. Well, the question becomes, how do you solve for that? Well, that's where this definition of the logarithm came from. That y is this y over here in the equation for y equals log base a of x. So it's the logarithm is defined to represent that exponent that was on the exponential function when you swapped your variables x and y to try and find an inverse. Okay. Um, Remember I was saying that x represents the input to the function, that's the domain. That x always has to be a positive value. And it's not literally the x, it's whatever goes into the logarithm. So you could have an expression that goes into the logarithm um, and it's not just one number or letter. The graph of a logarithm, and um, this is all summarized in your e-text and in your notes in the, the module and things. But the graph of a logarithm um, is an inverse to the exponential function. So at the beginning, I, I briefly showed that inverse functions are reflective over the line y equals x. So here's this line y equals x. So in blue is the exponential function. And over here is the exponential function. One is increasing, one is decreasing. And um, the red is then the log function. Again, one is increasing. So if your A for your base is greater than one, um, then this is your log function that is the inverse of this uh, exponential function with the same base. In this diagram, those A's are the same. And then if your base is between zero and one, 
for your logarithm. You get the decreasing one because it's the inverse of this exponential that also had a base between zero and one, okay? We have some special logarithms. One is the common logarithm. The common logarithm is base 10, but we just write it as the word log. So this is with base 10 and we don't write a subscript. So there's no subscript, it's just log, okay? So when you see just log, as opposed to um, log with a base A, uh, it is assumed that that base is 10 and it's the common logarithm. And you can see the graph of the exponential function 10 to the X that it's an inverse of here. And then the other special logarithm we have is a natural logarithm. And we also write that a special way. This is base E. So if I were to write log subscript base E of X, that means the same thing as we read it. Typically, you'll hear people say it as LN, but that's really the natural log as LN of X. We don't write it like how I cross out with a base of E. We write it as LN and LN um, stands for natural log but in the Latin form of the word for words for natural log, they are reversed. And so it's um, the logarithm like naturalis or something like that. I'm not up on my Latin, <laughs> but um, it's reversed. So that's why the abbreviation is an L and then N and not NL. And I also wanna make sure that in my lab, you make sure that you enter this together as a lower case, and I'm gonna write it uppercase. I'm gonna write it as a lowercase L when I type it in my lab. And you'll see that it'll turn bold when you do that. Um, some students don't realize that that's read as LN and they think that looks like a capital I and they type in a capital IN and then my lab doesn't recognize it and then they get the problem wrong. So I wanna make sure I point that out. All right, so I'm gonna take the time we have left to work through some problems um, on some things. So one of the problems I'm gonna take a look at and um, I'm gonna try and pop into my lab to do this. So actually, let me sign in. Should you look at the chat real quick? I did. Okay. Yeah, I, and I see that some of the stuff you asked is similar to the problems that I had on my list. Awesome. I just, that graph is really, like when you popped your graph up, some of the options you had on your graph, I didn't have. And I, I guess that's okay. that, means that I, um, I'm not going to use that, but to plot three points, I'm only given a parabola, the vertical, the horizontal, I'm given the straight line and then the, um, I don't, there's only there's only like five options and then I have the solid line and the dash line, but I'm not understanding how to what what tool I would click to be able to plot three points to connect a smooth curve line. It's not giving okay. me an option for a smooth will, curve line. Yeah, I will I will try and take is that 43 that you're talking about? Uh yeah, on yeah. six two, yeah, number twenty six forty. 6243. Oh, six, oh, sorry. Six, I read two. the other section. You're talking about 26 and 62. Okay. Sorry. That's different let homework. Me, it's 6 yeah, two. Sorry. sorry. That's why I say if you don't let have me, time, that's fine. I'm just really yeah. confused on let the me, part. Yeah. Let me um let me try and get to, to the one that I was just on. And that's then fine. I, I misread. I I I see that now that it says six two. Thank you. Um okay. So so 27 and 28. Let me open that in here. Because again, part of it is making sure you know how to get things entered into my lab. You may be able to do something on paper just fine, but then when you go to put it in my lab, like it doesn't work, <laughs> and then and then it's frustrating. It's a different ball game. Yes, it's yeah, a whole it's frustrating. It's like I know how to yeah. do it on paper. So I want to call to attention something here that it says type an equation. So when you are reading the instructions, this says to change this to an equivalent statement. This is using the definition of the logarithm that I just talked about. 
So you have to type an equation. It's not asking for just a number. You're not solving for anything in this type of problem. So I have to type an equation. So I see that my base is seven, my power is X, and it's equal to 8.6. And I know I just went over it quickly, but by the definition for logarithm, this is an exponential form. I want to switch it to log form. So my exponent X becomes my beginning of my statement. If that exponent was a Q, then I would start Q equals. If that exponent was a T, then I would start T equals. So my exponent becomes what I say the variable is equal to. And then I need a logarithm with a base of seven because my exponential part is with a base of seven. So I can just start typing log. And if you, I'll back that up and look again. If you look, if you watch carefully as I type it, it's not bold, it's not bold, but as soon as I type G to finish the word log, it shifted over slightly and it became bold. What that tells you is that my lab has now recognized that you typed the function logarithm and you weren't just randomly typing the letters log, okay? When you um, type I, it comes up on the imaginary I too. Like if you just type the I yeah, on the keyboard, yeah, it'll come right, up with there's, your imaginary so I. Yeah, so there's different things that if you watch carefully, the system will kind of, you know, notice certain things. So now I need a subscript. So I look at my tools down here and I pick the one that looks like a subscript. And so that's um, the second one from the, from the right. And now in that little box, I can put my subscript of seven. And now here's the other thing. If I just continue typing right now and I put um, uh, 8.6, it's next to my subscript of seven and that's not where I want it. So after you type your subscript, hit your arrow key to the right. And now my cursor is not in that box anymore. And it's not in the subscript, it's back up to the normal level. And now I can type 8.6, that that's what I'm taking the logarithm of. And I should be able to check that and now it accepts it. So you have to be really intentional about noticing where your cursor is, and how you type in the different values. Now, if I look at the next one, this had a base E. So this is what I wanna show you talking about where I was talking about you enter the natural log as the letters L, N, and it's the lowercase L. So this is base E raised to the X equals 24. So converting using my definition of a logarithm, my exponent is X. So I start out my equation with whatever that exponent was, well, in this case, X and then equals. And then that base E, I'm not gonna write the word log. I'm gonna use LN because that's the special way that we write a logarithm with base E. If I type an I, and that's what um, Tish was just talking about is that uh, it writes it as script thinking it's the imaginary I until I start writing something else. And then I type N, notice the N is in regular font and that just looks weird. Even the spacing is weird. So that is not my LN. And then what if you thought, well, what if I do a capital I? Well, that capital I sure looks like a lowercase L because if I type a lowercase L right next to it, they look almost the same. But if you actually look closely, the L is thinner than the I. <laughs> It, trust me, you have to have good eyesight to see it, but trust me, that's what it is. But if I just leave the I and the N, it did not turn bold, okay? And so because it's not bold, that's not my natural log function. So if I backspace and I use the actual lowercase L followed by an N, as soon as I hit N, ta-da, it turns bold. And so now I know I have it typed in correctly as the natural log function. And what am I taking the natural log of? I'm taking the natural log of 24, and then I can check that, okay? So that's just a couple tips with that. Um, some of the other things, and we're short on time, so I wanna talk about um, this um, graphing in number 43. You, this goes back to selecting the right tools again. So let me pull it up on the actual live tools. Okay, so here, I'm gonna make that bigger for you guys. All right, so I have to graph nine to the X and the inverse function log base nine of X on the same graph. So I click to enlarge this 
which I highly recommend you do. And so if I'm going to do nine to the X, okay, that's exponential. So I look at all my pictures. And if you're not sure what the pictures are, if you just hover your mouse over it, it'll tell you. Now, my cursor is really big, so my little hand is in the way, but that says Can line tool. That real quick. When I yeah. click on mine, mine don't have those two half lines. It just has those top three. It's got the circle, but instead of those two half lines, it's got a, a parabola, the vertical or the horizontal parabola. Are That's you on all. this exact same no, not problem? that problem. That's what I'm saying. I'm sure that the reason, but how would you make a smooth curve out of those uh, options I just told you? So, so I, I, I didn't quite hear you. You're on a different problem. Yeah, I'm on the same one I asked you about the I would I was just referring to the number 26 on 6243. Right. So when I if, click on so the if enlarged. You don't have those. So if you don't have those, then those aren't used. Probably exactly. for that. Yeah, my next question was out of the horizontal parabola, the vertical and those um, the top three you had there, how would you make a smooth curve line by plotting three points? I will have to pull up number 26 here in just a second because it's going to give you different graphing tools depending right. on which section and which problem you're working on. Okay. So okay. I didn't interrupt yeah. you. I just wanted because mine do, mine don't have those half those right. Those. And I assume that's why, but I just didn't know yeah. how to make a smooth because it okay. says connect a smooth curve or connect your points with a smooth curve. Okay. So so give me one minute and and I can jump over to that. Um, so for this one, just to wrap up, because we're almost at the time here, and I, I can help you just for a, a minute after it, but I, I want to be respectful of the other people who are here just for the, the live lecture part. Oh, absolutely. One minute. I've got a workshop at um, you, hey, so, so it's okay. Thank so you. So this is the exponential tool. So if I click that, then I can click anywhere, and it just puts the normal default. So now here at the bottom, notice the base says E. I don't want E. I want a base of nine. So I'm going to click in there, delete that and put in a nine. And then it's just the regular function. It doesn't have any stretching, shifting, reflecting. So now I can close that and then I can click off of that graph. Now it turns blue, so it's kind of fixed. And now I can do the log function. Well, out of these pictures, this one, underneath the arrow is my log tool and it'll tell you at the bottom down here see it says selected logarithm tool so if you're not sure what it is look for the name also so now if i click anywhere to plot again it gives me the default with a base e but my base is nine so i backspace that and put a nine and then it adjusts it on the graph and then i can close that extra toolbox and then click off of the graph so that it turns blue so now those are my my functions and i can save that and so because I changed the base, I can get it correct. If I don't change that base and it's the default E, you're going to get the problem wrong every time if you have a different base than E, okay? So we are out of time for the, the official lecture here. So I am going to stop. Um, again, there's a lot of rules and things for this week. Um, I do ask that if you have any um, feedback to give, I can go ahead and put this link to the survey in the chat so you can easily click on it um, for that. Um, and recordings, again, are gonna be back in the live lecture schedule. The one from Wednesday is there. Um, that might help with some of the 6-2 stuff. Um, and then um, there'll be another lecture tomorrow, uh, Saturday um, as well uh, for that. So um, that I, I am gonna stop the official recording. So I appreciate you attending um, and I hope this was very helpful for you guys.